You ready? Okay. Well, today we're going to go through a short presentation on Ezekiel's heavenly chariot throne vision. And I should say by virtue of the title, you may not have thought of it or heard it characterized in such a way. Uh, what Ezekiel saw is actually something that was known in, in his day and quite a bit before. Something actually pretty common uh, in literature uh, of the ancient world, including the Bible, and also the iconography of the ancient world and the Bible. What I mean by iconography, you will hear me use that term throughout the session, is essentially, in, in simplest terms, the artwork. Uh, usually sculpture, uh, carved reliefs, uh, in pictures of the day. I refer to them as the Polaroids of the day. Uh, people, you know, you know, wonder and speculate. Well, what did, you know, what did Ezekiel see in chapter one? And the vision is also actually uh, repeated, not identically, but very close to being identical in chapter ten of Ezekiel. You know, what did he see? You know, was it a flying saucer? You know, like we associate today. And there have been attempts to to argue that what Ezekiel saw was sort of the classic saucer UFO or something uh, with, a, with a high degree of similarity. And I'm going to suggest to you that, no, that isn't what he saw at all. We know what he saw because of the iconography of the day. Now, we got into this in the last Coast to Coast uh, show a couple weeks ago. And some of you may have heard of that, uh, heard that show or have heard me deal with this topic before. I just want to be clear from the outset. I do believe that it's, it's quite possible that you had flying craft, okay, technology that was capable of flight, let's just put it that way. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, I think the Vedic texts are a good example of this with the Vimanas. I mean, it, it just says point blank that these things were flying around and people were in them. You know, it would be ridiculous to just look at a text like that in the Vedic literature and try to say, no, no, that's not what it says. I mean, that's exactly what it says. My argument here, uh, while I accept what the Vedic texts say, I think high technology is possible. If we want to take Enoch seriously, when Enoch says pretty specifically that high technology, and even more specific than that, technology for warfare, was handed down, the knowledge of how to build this, the principles uh, of how to make these things and how to make them work, was handed down by the watchers. Uh, if we take that seriously, then you know, we should expect that to show up somewhere uh, in the ancient text. And in the Vedic case, you do have, again, serpentine beings flying around in these things. It's there in the literature. My position here is this is not what Ezekiel's describing because the descriptions just don't match. One and two, we know what he saw because of the iconography. So I'm not excluding you know, completely this idea from ancient literature, but in this chapter, I'm just not buying it for a variety of reasons. Now what follows here is a very brief verse-by-verse uh, -verse commentary. I'm just going to comment on a few things as we go through Ezekiel in regard to, to try to discern what he saw, whether it was some extraterrestrial craft, as some like to argue, or something else. Um, we don't need the interpretive drawings of certain authors today to figure out what he saw because we pretty much have them. Now, my position, my arguments are these. Now, look at these carefully so you know what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. All the elements of the Ezekiel vision can be accounted for by referring to, again, the Polaroids of Ezekiel's day. The well-known iconography of throne chariots, flying or otherwise, flying or stationary, spread throughout the ancient Near East in sculpture, paintings, and inscriptions. Let me, let me just summarize that. I'm saying all the elements of Ezekiel's description can be accounted for in the iconography. There is no iconographic representation of the thing that Ezekiel saw because what he does, is actually kind of interesting, is, is his vision is an amalgamation of familiar iconographic motifs in the artwork of the day. It changes a little bit in chapter 10 
and where it's really significant as far as the changes is, is, is when you get to the book of Revelation, when John refers back to Ezekiel's vision. There are some changes there that I think are, are noteworthy. And also in the book of Daniel, you have the same kind of throne. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into a little bit of this today. Uh, so the issue, the issue is not in, in biblical literature that the visions always stay the same. They, they differ, and I think there's a reason they differ. And I'm going to tell you right now that I have not worked this out to my own satisfaction. I've been influenced to think about some things differently uh, by Dave Flynn's work. And I will, I will call what I will give you in these areas my, my understanding of why the pictures change and what they mean. And I will tell you that right now I'm speculating. What I'm not speculating on are the elements of the vision. Those are all accountable for, accounted for in the artwork of the day. Now, novel translations, my second argument, offered by those who want a UFO in Ezekiel 1 and 10, can be shown to be linguistically and contextually flawed. Third, the UFO view is, I believe, simply unworkable in terms of the logical analysis of the text in English when assuming a technology so advanced to travel great distances in space. I'm not going to elaborate on that at the moment. When we get there, you will be able to discern what I mean more readily. Other comments. I think it's inconsistent to argue that the Bible is a borrowing of ancient Near Eastern literature on one hand, that it borrows the literature and culture and religion, and then ignore the thousands of depictions of throne chariot iconography from those cultures and Israel itself when interpreting Ezekiel's vision. What I mean by this is, on the one hand, you have people who, again, go to conferences like this and speak at conferences like this and researchers who write books on the Bible and UFOs and Ezekiel's vision. And one of the arguments that they'll use is that there's a consistency or at least a correlation between the biblical description, the biblical text, the biblical stories, the biblical content, the biblical religion, and Mesopotamia and Egypt and so on and so forth. Everybody in the field knows that. Fine, I will give you that because it's affirming the obvious, but I'm saying it's inconsistent for you to affirm that and then reject the fact that Ezekiel's vision, the elements thereof, are in that material. That is just inconsistent. That's trying to have your way with the text and not being honest with the data. Second, using ancient Near Eastern images and literature for theologically polemic purposes was a common practice for biblical writers. I give you an example there with the Baal epic. What I mean by this is, if you've already thought while you're listening to me here, well, why would Ezekiel use imagery known to the Egyptians, to the Babylonians, to the Phoenicians, to the, the indigenous population of Canaan. Why would a biblical prophet bring this material into the Hebrew Bible and, and use it in some message? It's actually quite common. In some cases, the Bible does this word for word with ancient Near Eastern material. And the reason is always, 99% of the time, is, is polemic, and that is, the prophet or the psalmist, it's usually the prophets of the psalms where this happens, will bring in the material, for instance, in the Baal example here, where Baal will claim to be the one who rides the clouds, the one who controls the heavens, the one who brings rain, the one who brings you know, crops and all this stuff. And the biblical author will bring this material in from Canaanite literature, in, in the Baal case, into the Bible, put it actually into what he's writing, and then tweak it. He'll change the name from Baal to Yahweh. And the purpose is this. No, you dunderheads. It's not Baal who controls the heavens. It's the God of Israel. He's using material they know to make his theological point. You know, we often do this in modern discourse uh, as by way of illustration. So in Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, I'm not going to go through the whole vision. The, the introductory verses are setting the vision in in the, uh, the, the precise time of the exile. If you go down to verse 4, the only thing I want to note in verse 3 is he's by the Kavar Canal, the, uh, the river Kavar in some translations. So we'll come back to that a bit. But verse 4, he says, I looked and lo, a stormy wind came sweeping out of the north, a huge cloud and flashing fire surrounded by a radiance. 
And in the center of it, in the center of the fire, a gleam as of amber. Now note, we have to assume at this early point that Ezekiel saw a cloud glowing within. Since Hebrew has a word for cloud, and it's used here, just a generic word for cloud, he could have said silver disc or silver circle, but he doesn't. Hebrew has words for silver, for disc, for round, for window, okay, for even for you know, little people in window. I mean, all of these things, a Hebrew writer in the 6th century could have just said it. They have the words. All you got to do is buy a Hebrew grammar and look at the index and the words are there. Okay, buy a, a guide to Hebrew vocabulary. I mean, it, it's very simple. If you have a computer program, you can even do it faster. He has the words in his vocabulary, but does not use them. Doesn't use any of them, in fact, in the entire chapter. So people who want to put these elements into the vision are just doing that, exactly that. They're putting them in for Ezekiel. In the center of it, that is the cloud, were also the figures of four creatures. Now these are identified as cherubim, cherubim in Hebrew, in the vision in chapter 10. He doesn't identify them here, but he refers back to it in chapter 10. It's the same vision, but 13 months later. This was their appearance. They had figures of human beings. However, each had four faces and each of them had four wings. The legs of each were fused into a single rigid leg. And the feet of each were like a single calf's hoof. And their sparkle was like the luster of burnished bronze. They had human hands below their wings. The four of them had their faces and their wings on their four sides. Each one's wings touched those of the other. They did not turn when they moved. Each could move in the direction of any of its faces. So whatever direction they moved, they all moved in unison. Each of them had a human face in front. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left. And each of the four had the face of, the eagle, of an eagle on the back. Such were their faces. As for their wings, they were separated above. Each had two touching those of the others, while the other two covered its body. Now to this point, we see the beings here. And here are the relevant features. They have a human or humanoid appearance, at least partially. Four animal faces, four wings, two touching the others and two covering each of their bodies. Their legs were fused into a straight leg. The feet were like calf's feet. It was sparkling with bronze. Again, it's just, you know, it's had some kind of shiny material. And they had human hands. Now, my question initially here is, do these creatures resemble any UFO occupants in the literature? Do they resemble any craft component? I think it's pretty obvious the answer to both is no. Remember, for deep space travel and the necessary velocity and or hyperspace capability, we can't have the lunar module or flying animals for that matter. You know, I've seen pictures of this and the people drawing the lunar module. Well, you know, I, I'm sorry, but the lunar module just will not do inner space, interstellar travel. Note, while Ezekiel does not use the word like, or does use the word like a lot, and he could therefore be searching for ways to describe what he sees, he does not say the creatures look like animals. He clearly identifies each animal face. So the old argument that, well, Ezekiel's just so overwhelmed with this alien, he can't, how do I describe this guy? Well, you know, he's like this, he's like that. That's not what he does. He clearly says it was a cherubim. There were four of them. He knows what cherubim are. Why? Because at practically everywhere you go in the ancient world, you run into them in the artwork. They're cherubim, and here's the kind of faces they had. He clearly identifies each face. Okay, he's not struggling for words here. Each creature moved straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. As for the form of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches. Torches here, this is just a side note, likely refers to divine beings. Now, some you know, commentators aren't going to agree with me there. Um, I have a verse quoted below for precedent there. Since one, it is a common description of angelic beings, or angels, or lesser gods in ancient Near Eastern religion. Uh, fiery beings. And two, verse 14 has creatures shooting back and forth like lightning. This really can't refer to the first four creatures since earlier it was said that their positions were fixed and coordinate with each other and that their wings touched. So these things flitting back and forth, these you know fiery torches or whatever, 
I, I think it's possible that they could be other angelic beings, but again, you know, that, that's just a possibility. Psalm 104.4 below here, he, God in context, fashions his angels as winds, his servants as fiery flames. Uh, it is a biblical idea, and it's, it's, it's a broad ancient Near Eastern idea as well. It, the fire, darted to and fro between the creatures like a flash of lightning, and the fiery creatures shot back and forth like sparks. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. So there's four wheels here. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same form, their construction being something like a wheel within a wheel. And that's likely concentric. Um, again, there are other possibilities, but it's, it seems to be, and the consensus seems to be in, in scholarship that he's probably describing something concentric. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. Their rims were tall and awesome, for the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. Now, again, the we think of a, you have four chariots, or excuse me, four cherubim. They're, they're positioned actually in a square because their wings have to touch. So the, they themselves are in a square formation, and beside each one of them is a wheel. So you have a four-wheeled kind of thing, and the rims of the wheels are covered with eyes. Again, it, it defies the classic UFO description, and I think when we get to the actual pictures, you'll, you'll see what he's thinking of pretty clearly. Note here, it is the rims of the wheels that are full of eyes. But when Ezekiel sees the same vision 13 months later, he adds this. The cherubs moved in the direction in which one of the heads faced without turning as they moved. Their entire bodies, backs, hands, wings, and the wheels, the wheels of the four of them were covered all over with eyes. Now this is going to be significant uh, for a specific reason later. So in chapter 10, it's not just the wheels, it's, it's everything. All the, the creatures are covered with eyes. It was these wheels that I had heard called the wheelwork. Hebrew there is Gilgal. When the living creatures went, the wheels went up by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creatures, living creature was in the wheels. When these went, these went. When the, excuse me. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. Basically he's saying they all moved together. They were all connected in some way. They were not moving independently. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Note, again, the wheels and the creatures, the cherubim, move in tandem. As the creatures go, so go the wheels. And remember again, store this away. The creatures and the wheels have lots of eyes on them. We'll talk about eyes in a bit. The likeness of the firmament, Hebrew word there is rakia, upon the heads of the living creatures. So there's, there's a firmament on the heads of the creatures. It's, it's attached to the creatures' heads. They're supporting it, in other words. Was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other, every one had two, which covered on his side, so on and so forth. When they went, again, we've, we've read a bunch of this, but I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty. It was pretty loud. The voice of speech as the noise of a host. When they stood, they let down their wings, and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. Again, we'll come back to this, but what UFO is powered by animals or creatures? Above the firmament that was over their heads. So you got the, the four cherubim, you've got this flat expanse over their heads. They're, they're holding it up, they're supporting it. And on that firmament, that rakia, was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. By the way, when you, if you go to Exodus 24 and other passages, uh, when the throne of God is described on Mount Sinai, it's the same description. Uh, he's, he's on a, a, a sapphire platform. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it, or above upon it. 
This informs us that the firmament was some sort of platform. Again, the throne is sitting on it, and there's somebody sitting on the throne. And I saw as the color of amber is the appearance of the fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud of the day of rain, very bright and colorful. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Note again, likeness here should be understood as representation. It is one of the words used in Genesis for the image of God. The object was constructed as some sort of throne or seat and was at the very top, again on top of the rakia, the platform, the expanse, the firmament. Now in Daniel 7, usually people who do research on Ezekiel 1 as a UFO, they, they never seem to get to this passage. That this object is indeed a throne is indicated by the other passage in the Old Testament where we see such a wheeled object. This is Daniel 7. This is one of the classic divine counsel passages, by the way. As I looked on, again, the scene is in heaven. Thrones, note the plural there. Thrones were set in place. So there's more than one throne in heaven. Thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. Now, I'm not going to go into the Ugaritic comparison comparisons here, but everyone agrees the Ancient of Days here is God. In the Ugaritic version, it's El. His garment was, was like white snow, and the hair of his head was like lamb's wool. His throne was tongues of flame. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire streamed forth before him. Thousands upon thousands served him. Myriads upon myriads attended him. And the council sat and the books were opened. Specifically, this is the vision of Daniel sees four beasts here. The four beasts show up in Revelation, uh, as again does the heavenly throne. Summation so far. Human or humanoid appearance of creatures. The creatures have again these features that we, we saw before. There's a platform supported by the four creatures, and there's a deity atop the platform. Now, examining all those features against the iconography, again, as I try to do, I want you to know that I'm not making it up. I'm not just going to stand here and tell you that people have studied iconography and can account for the features. You want to confirm it. You want to check me out. hope you can read German. Uh, these are the major works. Now, there are smaller works, and some of Othmar Kiel, he is, he's probably the world's expert on ancient Near Eastern iconography, at least as it relates to Syria, Palestine. He's still alive and still writing, and, and uh, a number of his works have been translated into English. Unfortunately, this one has not. <clears throat> but here is the title in English. I, I've translated that much for you. Uh, <clears throat> but he has lots of nice plates and pictures and hand drawings of you know, original sculptures in it. He's you know, hundreds and hundreds of them. The other one, Martin Metzger, <coughs> none of his work, as far as I know, is translated into English. But the title here is Div you know, Royal Thrones, King's Thrones, and Divine Thrones, Throne Forms and Throne Portrayals in Egypt and the West Orient in the 13th and 12th you know, millennium, 13-1200s, uh, before Christ, and their meaning for the understanding of the Aosazagan is sort of portrayal or description uh, concerning the throne of, in the Old Testament. So this is a, a book that you know, deals with the very subject we're talking about, a, a, a complete scholarly monograph to, devoted, devoted to the subject. So my argument, again, is that all the elements are well known in Ezekiel's day and are part of the political and religious context, and that this fact, coupled with the absence of exegetical arguments and the logic, the illogic, in favor of a UFO, answers the question of what Ezekiel saw. I'm just going to take you through a few examples. And again, there's no one image that, that is Ezekiel. But again, the motifs are very common. And I literally could have put hundreds of these on here, but my laptop does not have much space, and frankly, we don't have that much time. So here is a four-faced deity. Obviously, you can't see the face on the other side. 
Here are, th these are actually Mesopotamian cherubim, but you, if you look at the legs, the hooves, the sets of wings, right? we'll come back to these guys in another presentation. This is part of a throne. Again, here you can see what remains of the throne picture. Again, the four winged cherubim with their wings touching. Underneath, the rakia, the platform, atop which is the, front, the throne. Here's a nice uh, example of cherubim. Again, it's very common to have four uh, in, in, in a circle like this. The rakia at the top, the platform, could be round. It often was. Sometimes it's square, sometimes it's round. Again, just cherubim that form a seat. Very, very common in the ancient world. Again, the deity or the king seated upon the cherubim throne. Here's another example. Uh, this, by the way, I don't know if Dave Flynn here, this is from, um, this is from the coffin of Ahiram, Hiram of Tyre. We actually have his coffin. And there's an inscription on it that I had to translate for my preliminary exams in, in grad school, but it gives you a nice idea. And Hiram, if you remember, was the one who Solomon went to to design the temple. The throne of Yahweh, cherubim seat. Okay. Uh, again, we're getting into some wheels here. It was common to have wheels underneath the feet of the cherubim. Here's just a wheel, a, th a throne with a wheel. Uh, this is a four-faced cherubim, okay, a body of an ox in this case. This is Egyptian. Uh, four wings, four faces. Again, four faces with the wings. This only has two, but again, the ox feet. I, I, I really like this one because this almost has every element in it. You'll notice carefully here if you look at this. You've got cherubim. There's the wings touching. They'd have, they have faces and multiple faces pointing in different directions. The legs are fused into one. They're actually hooves of a calf with wheels. This is a throne platform, again, Syria of Palestine. Deity with, it's obviously a phallic deity, but we've got the four-winged cherubim, again, with eyes covering it. What I'm going to give you here is the standard view, but I'm going to disagree with uh, part of this, but with the iconography. Again, all I'm saying is that all the elements are available and I've only given you a dozen or so pictures from the sources that I gave you. If you want to go you know, look them up, loan them from a library, you're, of course, free to do that. might be worth your time. But what about the logic of the UFO and Ezekiel hypothesis? What do I mean by that? Simply that if we assume Ezekiel is describing a flying saucer from another world, the narrative itself undermines the idea. Does it make any sense to have a craft from space powered by animals? The description of fire and flames is often presented as evidence that we are dealing with a flying alien craft. Flame indicates a combustion engine. No physicist, no matter how charitable their attitude toward alien life, would defend the idea that a combustion engine could navigate the expanses of space, attaining the necessary speed or succeed in utilizing and surviving a wormhole if that were even possible. Nobody is going to say that because it is, in terms of physics, absurd. Okay? And if you're going to say this is some kind of alien craft, you better account for all the elements, and that includes the flame. You have combustion. Makes no sense at all. The fire is even said to contain hot coals and not something like coals. He, he uses the word coals. Since God commanded the coals be scattered over the city, in Ezekiel 10, uh, he, he commands one of the cherubim, or one of the, the fiery beings, to scoop up the coals and scatter them over the city. And the being does that. So now we have a coal-powered space vehicle. I mean, we're, this is like the Industrial Revolution in reverse. Okay, it just makes no sense at all. What about the rakiach? Okay, I think that... Do I want to do this or not? I may come back to this. I, what I actually did, let me, let me just summarize what, what people are saying about the rakia. I, I've gotten a, a number of, of emails from different people, one person in particular, who insists that rakia 
the firmament or expanse is a circular dome. And, and you know, obviously he wants to get a flying saucer out of that. And the argument is that you know, this is what it describes because in Genesis it talks about the firmament of the sky. I have a, a Word document here. We, we may refer back to it if we have time. Uh, if you want to see it, I can, I can uh, put it on a disc for you if you want to take it with you. But I looked up all the occurrences of the word rechia in my database, my database of the Hebrew Bible. And I looked up the root form, the verb form, raka, which means to pound. Uh, pound is probably the best word, to beat. What it is is, is the, the act of beating out either in, in the Hebrew Bible, you're stomping on the ground or beating out a piece of metal. You know, it's, it's metal work that you would overlay and beat with a hammer. Uh, there is nothing in the word at all that has anything to do with a circle. The reason why it's round in Genesis should be obvious. Because if we're describing the firmament of the sky, to the visual observer, you go from one to the other. You view the horizon. Okay, the expanse of the sky. That's going to come into play in, in a bit because it's important as to why the firmament of the sky is round. But there's nothing actually in the context of Ezekiel. We read the entire chapter that in and of itself would indicate roundness. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion here. If, as I'm saying, that the, the throne platform in the vision is flat but probably circular, could be, you know, the, the, the vision isn't that specific, but it's flat, thrones on top of it. But then you have this, the round firmament of the sky and, and, and all these, these different creatures with eyes on it. I'm going to suggest, and here's where I'm going to speculate and go out on a limb here. I'm going to suggest that the vision of Ezekiel has something to do with procession, with constellations. All Four of the constellations, those four that we read about, or the, the, the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision, those are the four cardinal points of the zodiac in the ancient world. I don't think that's a coincidence. They are the four cardinal points. And again, if I'm wrong here, I'm going to blame Flynn. So <laughs> but let's, let's take a look at some other passages, and you'll see where I'm going here. At First Chronicles 28 King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers, my people. I wanted to build a resting place for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. And I laid aside material for building. Now, if you remember the Ark of the Covenant, the two foot, essentially two foot by three foot, you know, roughly box uh, that the Israelites toted around in the Old Testament, it had a lid with two cherubim on top. Their wings, they were facing each other and their wings were facing each other. And the lid was called the mercy seat, the place of propitiation, because the high priest once a year would sprinkle blood on that for atonement at Yom Kippur. Uh, but notice it was where it was called a mercy seat. It was sort of where God sat okay, when he spoke to Moses or, again, when the high priest made intercession. It was, it was God's you know, throne. Here it's called a footstool. What's going on there? Well, why is it a footstool now? Well, because in the temple, this comes from Metzger's book, by the way. When you have to be a little bit familiar with the ark, here's the ark down here. The ark was portable, as was the tabernacle in which the ark was, was kept. The Israelites would move from place to place. They'd set this thing up, you know, do their thing, you know, conduct worship, whatever. And then they would move on when, when they were directed to do so. When the temple was built, obviously a stationary building, Inside the Holy of Holies, Solomon was instructed to build two cherubim, to put two giant cherubim in here, their wings touching. I tend to think that these two wings might have been flat, but we'll go with Metzger's drawing because if I drew one myself, it would really be stupid looking. Um, because this now in the temple was the seat where God sat and his feet rested on the ark. That's why the ark was called the footstool. Okay, the ark was actually inserted between the cherubim. We know this from descriptions of the temple uh, that are given in the Bible. Now take that image and go to this. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where could you build a house for me? What place could serve as my abode? 
interesting image. Keep that in mind. This is the ancient Near Eastern conception of the world. In the ancient Near East, including Israel, I know I'm going to offend maybe some literal 24-hour day creation people, but oh well. You had the earth, the earth was viewed as flat, and again, perhaps round, but flat. Over the earth, you had the rakia, the firmament, the dome. The view was that the, the, the cosmography, the, co the, the cosmic geography, as it were, of the ancient world thought that the ancient person thought that the sky you saw was actually a dome to which were affixed the stars. And, they, and they, they could see the stars move, the constellations, in regular cycles. And they thought that everything was encased in a dome so that the waters, you know, you have these phrases in the Bible, the waters above and the waters below the firmament. You know, you, you have, they, they believe there was water out here, water below, waters below the earth, and then you had, a, you know, waters really below, uh, beneath the other waters of the earth. This was Hades, the nether word, world, or hell. Of course, the heaven of the highest heaven. The reason this is kind of significant is when God says, the, the earth is my footstool. There are, there are verses in the prophets that have God sitting above the heavens, looking down upon the earth. Now, here's my suggestion. Is it possible that Ezekiel's vision, if we impose, superimpose Ezekiel's vision on here, you would have wheels on the sides. And I think the reason there are four is because of the four cardinal points. But that would mean that you have wheels rotating in this direction if the wheels in fact were set right here. I think it could be a, an ancient Israelite description of precession. And why precession? There are the wheels. Because again, in the vision, man and cherub, it's, it's man in, in uh, chapter one, cherub in chapter 10. Cherub, we, cherub as we have seen is a humanoid being. These are the four cardinal points of the ancient Near Eastern Zodiac. They correspond again to the the cherubim and Ezekiel. Notice that in 10, the eyes were in the creatures and, it, and also the wheels. In the ancient world, eyes, the word eyes, was often used as a description or euphemism for guess what? Stars. Now, uh, you go back here again to these guys, again, this is, again, sort of the humanoid appearance. The man and cherub, again, taken together. But that's my suggestion. So what to conclude, what I think is going on here is not a UFO, but I think it really could be the key to linking the processional idea that is very common in classical literature, uh, in the Greek world, in the Hellenistic world, to the Bible. I mean, to a vision, and it, it, especially a Flynn's suggestion that essentially what, what the ancients looked, when the ancients looked at the universe and they thought essentially it was, it was a clock, it was a chronometer, the universe as chronometer. If that's the case, and I, I don't have any, I, I can't really take this any further, what, I, what I'll say here, but it really fascinates me to wonder if the time when the vision is given is when the exile began, and of course Ezekiel is told that there, the exile is going to end, but the fact that it shows up in Revelation later, and it shows up in Daniel in connection with the four beasts, which are identified as four kingdoms, again, which are taken up in Revelation, could it be that procession has something to do with prophecy, and prophecy has something to do with procession? Because when it shows up in Revelation, it's, just, it's the beasts again. John says, I looked up into the heavens, and I saw the throne of God in the heavens, and the four beasts on the throne, and they were filled with eyes. I think if you take it literally, it might mean exactly what he says. I looked up in the heavens. The heavens are where, is where God's throne is. The earth is his footstool. And I saw these creatures, and they were filled with eyes. And they surrounded the throne. Uh, again, just a suggestion, but something I'm going to be playing with for probably the next year. And you know, if we do something related to that next year, you might hear a little bit more. So that's all I have for that. And I think they're, they're going to take... Uh, Q&A afterwards. So what do I do right, now? Actually, we do have time. I'd like to ask a couple of questions right now on okay. the subject. And there will be a Q&A mic, so we'll get that set. OK. 
okay is however that one you want that to be done. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think. I don't, I don't think the point of the vision is that the throne was literally flying. I mean, when when, when, Ezekiel, when Ezekiel sees it, it's in the air. Okay. But how did he get in there? Because that's where it appeared. See, you, Everything I know. right? But you're you're thinking you're thinking that it is a vehicle or a contraption, and what I'm suggesting is that when when Ezekiel sees this, he sees all these elements, and I think he is thinking of prophetic statements and that the point of the vision is that God is showing him essentially again I'm through procession but is he seeing a real thing? I, well real in what sense could you go up and touch it and, right. and punch it that kind of thing uh, yes. I don't I don't I don't think there's there are places where where visions like this show up for instance in Isaiah 6 where one of the beings will will touch the prophet okay so in that sense, if we were in Isaiah 6 or whatever passage, I'd say, yeah, you know, he's, he's touched by them. We don't have that here. It's in the air. It never, come, it never comes down and, and never interacts with him. He's just observing it. So in this case, I don't, I don't know. Why is it in? Because I'm sorry. Uh, when, they, when he says it's in the air, I can't. Well, I think, I think it is in the air. Solid object. That, that we don't know. We can hear it, which implies okay, that it's solid. But if you had, let's say you had a ghost appear in front of you and the ghost said something. You hear something, but that doesn't mean you can go up and grab it and touch it. It doesn't mean it's corporeal. In other words, when a vision may be just visual or it may be something solid. And I'm saying in other contexts, we're actually told something in the text where we could conclude that it is solid. But in other cases, it might just be Again, something purely visual. I don't really think it matters because I think the point of the vision is prophetic. I think he's telling Ezekiel that the time of the exile will end uh, in, in 70 years. Uh, I think, again, the, the point is that I control the future. If you want to know when these things are going to happen, follow, you know, I hate, hate to make it sound this way, but follow the stars. I mean, just, I, I'm, I really think that you, if you match this to Daniel 7, which, which everyone who studies prophecy knows is a significant passage. You've got the, the four beasts, again, in Daniel 7. You've got Daniel 2 with the image. You've got Daniel 7. You've got Ezekiel 1. You've got Ezekiel 10. You've got Revelation. In Revelation, John just merges them all together into, into one massive you know, heavenly vision. I think the point is, is, that, is that the God of Israel controls the future. And if you want to know what his timetable is, relatively speaking, in terms of epochs, you look at procession. But that beast has got to be an actual thing. You, which which beast? You're talking about the beast in Revelation? In any... I... There, there's a, there has to be a reason why the beasts selected correspond to the zodiac. And by the way, I, I do believe the beast, the Antichrist, is a person. Okay. But... What we're dealing here with is the, the throne of heaven, the fact that, that the, the Lord as sovereign controls time, controls the progression of events, and is giving Ezekiel a glimpse into the fact that, yeah, you're my inheritance. You're sitting here. If you read the whole thing of Ezekiel, they're sitting there by the river Kivar. They've just been taken into exile. And there are certain psalms that refer back to this episode where, the, where their captors are taunting them, saying, hey, sing us one of the songs of Zion now. Tell us how impenetrable Zion really was after we just basically kicked your butts all over the earth and brought you back here. And they're wondering, what are we doing here? Isn't God supposed to be on our side? And Ezekiel has sent this vision to basically say, yeah, he still is. He controls the future. You still have a future. You're here, it's your own fault that you're here. If you remember yesterday, we read the covenantal passages about following the other gods and what's going to happen to you. God says, well, you know, you didn't listen. You're in exile now, but you are still mine. And there's going to become, I know the future. I know the future. And these beasts give you a glimpse of it. 
give you a little hint of it. And it's going to show up in Daniel, and it's going to show up in Revelation. Because I think, again, if I'm wrong, I'm going to blame Flynn. But <laughs> and nobody does this. I only know of one New Testament scholar who is actually a credentialed scholar in the field who nowadays takes Revelation as, as astral prophecy. And I think he's right. I think he's onto something there. It used to be 100, 150 years ago when people were more in tune to the kind of thing that Flynn is doing now that you had scholars, and I mean major mainstream credentialed scholars that, that said, you know, this really looks like astral prophecy. That's very uncommon now. Um, it's, it's very hard to find material to help you here because it's, it's essentially been forgotten. Uh, and astrology has gotten a bad name, and I don't want to give it a good name like you should go out and, and do your horoscope. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about something in, entirely different. But you had a question. Uh, that's basically what I was going to ask you. You're using astrology here simply as a measurement of time. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Certainly not the astrology of reading your horoscope. No, no. Right. I mean, that, that, that's, it's, clearly, it's clearly forbidden uh, in the scriptures. But here's the interesting thing. The ancients, uh, I, have a, I have an acquaintance, I wouldn't call him a friend, but I have an acquaintance, his name is Lester Ness. And you can look him up on Amazon because you can actually get his work now. But he did his dissertation a fair, fair amount of time ago now uh, under Edwin Yamauchi, who is a, a Christian Gnostic scholar. He teaches my, at the University of Miami at Ohio. He did his dissertation on zodiac mosaics in Jewish synagogues. And there's a lot of them. Lot of them. <laughs> exactly. And not only that, but in the, in the early church, the early church fathers, and, and the, the villain or hero here, depending on your perspective, is Origen, yeah. O-R-I-G-E-N, uh, really looked at Revelation as astral prophecy. Because what they were doing, what the rabbis were doing, is they're saying, look, God created the universe. It has order. It, it is his map of the heavens. It is a chronometer. The glory belongs to him. We're not sitting there, who should I date? Who should I marry? And, you know, what day should I have my bar mitzvah? Or something like that. They're looking at it as, as a map of where God is going in human history. That's why they did it. And it was, it was a very uh, ancient and an honored practice. But again, as astrology started to get a bad name in the ancient world because of, the, frankly, the silliness of it. And also, I think, as, as the knowledge of the divine council was either lost or stamped out because of the whole divine plurality problem. And again, the guy here is Augustine. Mm -hmm. Augustine, when he became a, a convert to Christianity, he linked up with the Manichees and had a bad relationship with them eventually. They held the Book of Enoch in esteem. And when he split from the Manichees, I mean, I'm, this isn't my guess, there's a lot of scholarly literature on this. When he split from the Manichees, he said, I want nothing to do with Enoch. I want nothing to do with this council stuff. And he became so influential in the early church that that is when the Sethite view of Genesis 6 came up because he created it. Okay, he is the, he is the pivotal figure uh, in, in, in church history for why all of a sudden the church just sort of you know, moves away from this and what, what people like Flynn and what eventually I hope to, uh, to contribute here is essentially we, need, we should go back to our roots. We should go back to what the early church was thinking we should go back to, to, to viewing Christianity through a Jewish lens and ultimately through a, an ancient Israelite lens and then take a look at what biblical theology is. Uh, I'm not saying you know, we're going to come out completely in some other direction, but I think it will, it will sharpen the focus and lend a lot of clarity to some things that right now people are just pulling their hair out. And who knows what this means? So Yes, in the back. Uh, two questions. Um, I, I didn't hear you say the word theophany, which is what I thought was the you know, prominent yeah. Christian view of uh, Ezekiel. And then the second it, one is... It is a theoph theophany. is just a, an appearance of God. In, they're usually anthropomorphic, but not always like the burning bush. But go ahead. So, so do you believe that the Ezekiel vision was a theophany, or was it... Did he was actually it a Christophany? No, a, a theophany. Okay. Or, or what's, what's the alternative you're going to give me? <laughs> or, or he actually saw the uh, throne... Uh, you know, a vision of the throne of God. Well, he, he says he sees the throne and, and something like a man sitting on it. So, yeah, I would call it a theophany. Some, some Christians want to say, and I'm not saying there's not merit to this. I, I, I just, 
I don't know if he can say it every time, but some would want to say that any time you have the God of Israel, because of an iconism, the, the resistance against images, you know, thou shalt make no graven image. Some people would say whenever, any time in the Bible when you see God pictured in human form at all, even if it's like just his feet, that that's Christ, that's, that's like a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. I don't have any trouble with that. I'm just not sure that that's the case. Uh, but yeah, I would use the, the word theophany. And then, and then the second question is, uh, uh, how, did, how did you offend the 24-day literal, or the seven-day well, literal creation? Because, because the, when, when you say that the ancient Near Eastern worldview, including Israelite, has a flat earth, a lot of them aren't going to like that. And by the way, there, uh, if, if you want to read somebody who, if you are a conservative Christian or a conservative Jew in the audience and you're wondering, well, how do we square this with ideas like biblical inspiration, biblical inerrancy, uh, I, could, I could say subscribe to my newsletter, but I won't. I'll tell you where it is. <laughs> uh, there are a couple articles by a guy named Paul Seely, S-E-E-L-Y. Uh, he's done three of them on this subject. Two of them are in Westminster's journal. And you can buy these, these, the major theological journals on CD if by going to a place called Galaxy Software. But he's, he's done work on this, and he, has, he essentially takes John Calvin's view of inspiration and inerrancy, where he says that there are, there are places in the Bible where God, to, to get across a very difficult intellectually concept to an ancient people, will accommodate himself to the beliefs of their day to get the message across. And, and he says this is an instance of that. Yes. Here in, in, the, in the black here. Um, in, in the Bible, they, Jesus said, you're going to become fishers of men. And this was told to me, to, and as well as what I'm seeing here and what you're saying about this probably being the procession mm -hmm. of time, a description of the procession of time. Uh, I'm seeing this as this is that code, a way of describing things in code because of uh, not only they didn't want people, such as the Gentiles, to, to understand what it was that they were talking about, but also to prevent uh, the works or their words being misconstrued by those that don't understand it. Uh, to be used against them also, uh, that they spoke in code to prevent themselves from being um, um, understood by those that were not uh, it, of their teachings. It's certainly true in the early church for obvious reasons, you know, for, for persecution reasons that you know, things had to be cloaked a bit. So I'm wondering if, if this is it's just simply the wording was chosen on the basis of cloaking this and that it is basically symbolic. Mm -hmm. And being that this is symbolic, is, isn't that what leading one to believe that a lot of things in the Bible might also be symbolic? Some of, this, some of this question goes to the issue of hermeneutical schools in the ancient world. And there were certainly uh, schools that developed in, in the New Testament era, and even before that, in the rabbinic uh, I, should, I shouldn't say rabbinic, in the Second Temple era, where methods of exegesis approached the text just like you're saying, that it was metaphor and that it was, it was allegory, that kind of thing. Um, with, without discounting that, I think what we need to do is when we, I'll just speak personally here, I accept that that may be the case, but what I need is, is I need some sort of check and balance system so that I don't just go to the text and say, well, this symbolizes this and this symbolizes that. I mean, I, I just see so much of this and, because there's no controls. Anything can symbolize anything else. So what I think what, what we need to do to honor that idea, because I do think that idea is there in exegesis and in history, is look for what, in terms of their world, where the symbology lines up the commonly accepted symbology, what I mean by that is, in a case like this, again, it's very obvious that you're dealing with the cardinal points of the zodiac. Well, that comes from somewhere, and it means something. So in that, in those symbols, I'm going to look for correlations and treat them symbolically. By the way, symbolically doesn't mean that 
it's not going to play out on Earth. It just it refers to what plays out on Earth, you know, what exactly is going to happen. But I will look then for, okay, what did the symbols mean in Babylonia and in Canaanite religion, in Israelite religion? Because I know Israelite religion uses so much of this. So that is the check and balance system. Only look for symbology where symbology is apparent cross-culturally and where the prophets themselves are, are treating what they're doing as a symbol. Usually they'll tell you. Uh, sometimes they don't, which is the frustrating part. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just wary, while I accept what you're saying, I'm wary of, of just letting people run with it, including myself, uh, because there's just no checks and balances. It's kind of like where, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of typology. A typology is... There's two kinds of prophecy. There's oral prophecy where the prophet says, thus says the Lord, this and that's going to happen, then he lays it out. There's unspoken prophecy, and those are called types. People, institutions, events in the Old Testament prefigure something that will happen later. For instance, we're told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 that the Passover lamb of the Old Testament prefigured the crucifixion of Christ. It was an unspoken prophecy. It depicted something, a reality that would happen later. Now, people have, have seen this. Bible scholars have, have seized upon this. And so now there's a tendency among some people to see a type everywhere. Everything's a type of something else. And what I'm saying is, no, let's stick with what the New Testament actually says is a type in the old and just leave it there. In other words, I don't want to set myself up as the authority to, to determine for you or anybody else what a type is. I'm going to go with the ones where they actually use uh, the, the system, and, and I can see that they're using it because of something that appears in the old, and they, what they do with it in the new. Relating to you, the, the, the Jews in the, in the intertestamental period would use stuff like this, and they understood it astrally, especially at Qumran. And when John does the same thing in Revelation, I'm thinking... Okay, there's a stream of tradition there okay, that I should follow. I'm not going to make up any of my own, but I'll follow this one. Okay, and that's the check and balance that I think we need. But are we, are we ready to do something else? Or I guess I should do something else here. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get it up here.